Hello everybody, Zach Kortz here with RevZilla and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider where we learn about motorcycles as we ride. Our guest today is a very exclusive, dare I say, hoity-toity uh, machine from our friends across the pond in jolly old England. That is a Triumph Daytona 765 Moto2 Limited Edition and it will cost you $17,500 if you can get one of the 765 that were allocated to North America. So it's very exclusive, it's very covered in carbon fiber. Is it a good daily rider? Well, we are about to find out. Here we go. <laughs> hey yo everybody, Triumph Daytona 765. There's lots to unpack here, so let's chew it over. So you got your 765 cc inline triple uh, that is essentially taken from the street triple rs although there are many many different components in there that actually make it a little bit more similar to the moto 2 engines that are used as a spec power plant in the moto 2 world championship hence the moto 2 branding on the tail section but anyhow basically the same daytona chassis here with the frame subframe and swing arm and this bike's basically just all about the details the stylema Brembo calipers, the Olin's uh, NAX30 uh, fork and TTX36 shock. You'll notice that there's carbon fiber absolutely everywhere. But <laughs> all the bodywork, basically, not the gas tank, um, but all the bodywork is carbon and it's just super tasty up close. The super slender aero pipe, uh, which I don't know why more manufacturers don't do this. Just make a nice thin pipe. It's all piped into a bread box under there anyway. So just make this nice and slender. Why not? It looks totally slick. TFT dash is new technically for the Daytona series, lifted from other models as is the switch gear. We'll talk about that as we go, but this is kind of the best part of any Triumph is starting it up. Excellent. <laughs> okay, we got our big stock and brakes. We've got our Swedish gold suspension. We got carbon fiber. Let's hit the road. So off we go and first thing we'll talk about is specifications and specs on this bike are pretty normal despite its uh, super exclusive name and numbers. Uh, it is a 32.3 inch seat height, uh, 4.6 gallons of gas in this here tank. Um, it is very light actually, 414 pounds, and that is not a claimed weight, 414 pounds on the new Daily Rider scales. That's right everybody, I've got scales and I know how to use them. So from here on out, with any luck, Daily Rider will include actual measured weight with a full tank of gas. So uh, I'm kind of excited about that because I think it's um, pertinent to <laughs> motorcycles we ride and um, how we learn about them and talk about them. So I'm excited to be able to provide that information. So 414 pounds, and that's pretty light for a bike of this size. That's basically, that's maybe 10, 15 pounds heavier than a Yamaha MT-07 with a full tank of gas. And this bike has 128 claimed horsepower and uh, 57 foot-pounds of torque. <laughs> so uh, that means, I don't know, almost double, right? Double? So around double the amount of horsepower that you get from an MT-07 and almost the same weight, just a shade heavier. So all that carbon fiber bodywork is doing its job. As for riding position, yeah, quite a bit less comfortable than an MT-07. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, oh geez, that's the freeway we're going to have to get on. And it's all backed up. This is going to be fun, huh? Anyway, this is a very aggressive sport bike. Um, the seat is not especially tall, uh, uh, just over 32 inches, like I said. Um, and the bike's nice and narrow in the middle, which is good. So the standover height, um, uh, inseam height is not too bad, but the handlebars are very low and the foot pegs are pretty high. So yeah, not exactly uh, a touring motorcycle. The last episode we did was the Harley Lowrider S and I complained about uh, those ergonomics basically because they're also uncomfortable. In some ways the Lowrider S or a cruiser in general is more comfortable than a bike like this because you're sort of, you're sitting back, it's not as hard on your neck. Um, 
but in general I'm just more likely to tolerate this kind of un, uh, uncomfortable bike because I like that there's purpose behind it you know it's uncomfortable because if you take it to a racetrack it's actually a lot better to sit in this position <laughs> plus your feet are underneath you when you hit a bump you can kind of like put weight on your feet like, here we go we're gonna hit this bump right here uh, and the suspension is firm on this bike certainly unambiguous I would say <laughs> it provides very direct feedback from the road but yeah you can put a little bit of weight on your on your feet and avoid the shock going through your spine which you can't do on a cruiser so that's my sort of subjective breakdown of the lack of comfort <laughs> on this bike and sport bikes in general well I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to go freeway speeds ever so I'm just gonna tell you <laughs> what it's like to ride on the freeway since I don't know if that's gonna happen it is kind of uncomfortable the fairing does almost nothing I'm not sure if you can see from this camera angle but from where my eyes are I basically look down onto the top of <laughs> the bubble it's for being full tuck is what it's for it's not for taking any wind off your body while you're riding and yeah I mean it does on the freeway take the wind away from my stomach basically <laughs> but that's kind of it yeah we are flipping stopped on the freeway what I'm going to do is turn this, this uh, dash is on auto uh, contrast, but I'm going to turn it to high contrast, which is white background, so we can see it a little bit better. I don't know why the auto is not, it's kind of an overcast day, but still, should be doing better work than that. More to the point about the dashboard is, uh, or the, the dash screen, I should say, is that normally uh, Triumphs are uh, adjustable. So you can like, uh, I'm not gonna look down at the dash, but I think this is it. You can pull back on it and adjust the angle, but on this bike, you cannot adjust the angle and it's basically pointed at my belly button, which is a little bit annoying. I wish I could just like angle it up. So when I look down at it, I could see it, um, but it's not designed for that. It's designed for this, full tuck, brah, brah. So yeah, it actually looks pretty good when I'm doing this. <laughs> But I'm not doing that. I'm doing this sitting upright thingamajig on the freeway going 30 miles an hour. Great balls of fire. We're finally out of the traffic. Okay, so you know all that stuff I said about aerodynamics and comfort and stuff. Yeah, all that stuff except now when we're riding. <laughs> Last thing I'll say about ergonomics is that it just, it's a really nicely built motorcycle sort of from start to finish and that goes for all the things that contribute to it not being very comfortable also it's just really nice the seat is tall and narrow and arguably made for a racetrack but it's still very comfortable the material's nice and it's the right amount of soft and firm um, and all the controls are just in the right place the the way that the seat meets the tank down here is just it's a really nice shape it fits fits my body at six foot two just fine and um, one of my usual test subjects a uh, buddy of mine who's about five foot eight uh, he rode it and he thought the same thing just to, it fits well it's a really really nice size for a motorcycle and it's engineered beautifully what else do we usually talk about on freeway fuel mileage 36 mpg that's what I've calculated so far it's the average um, what I've gotten which is uh, ah, not great <laughs> but I don't know not bad whatever it's not like you're buying a limited edition sport bike to get good gas mileage right the mirrors on this bike are pretty bad I gotta say most sport bikes have pretty bad mirrors and this one is no exception they're too small and they're not in the right place all I can see is my elbows I can look under my elbow or I can look over I gotta move my elbow <laughs> I want to see anything other than my elbow but you know again probably not why you're purchasing a Olin's suspended carbon fiber body worked Grand Prix replica street bike just before we get off the highway I'm doing a couple little roll-ons here just because it's such a delightful sound that this machine makes <laughs> great roll-on power nice smooth linear power as you often get from a triple especially Triumph triples a lot of intake noise the pipe's not very loud despite being real skinny because like I said it all dumps down into that bread box we do our stop sign test how many footless stops can we get Ooh, that was a little shaky we can test the TC on the gravel 
This is kind of a, an interesting blend of two different things with this bike riding it around a neighborhood because normally sport bikes are just not great at this kind of thing in general because the riding position is tricky. I mean, yeah, you're holding on to the top of the fork and so the feedback is direct, but um, it's the balance. Ooh, that was a good one. The balance is, is not necessarily easy when you're hunched over the front of the bike and everything's just kind of like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, just ergonomics basically make it a little bit more difficult. This bike, however, is sort of average, if not above average when it comes to um, the ergonomic discomfort, but what it is definitely above average in is precision in the controls. Everything is just really, really nice. <laughs> the, the fueling, as it often is on Triumphs, is freaking perfect. It's so good. It doesn't really matter if you're in rain or road or sport or track or the configurable rider mode, which I'm going to turn on in a minute here. We're in road mode right now. Uh, it just, the fueling is so excellent. It's not abrupt at all. Um, and the brakes are sharp and everything about the bike is just precise. It feels like when you give the machine feedback, uh, it does exactly what you want it to do every single time. There's no sloppiness or play, which is kind of rare. And I, I love that about this bike. <laughs> Excellent engine. Excellent engine. Corvette guy. Both Corvettes. Clean living. All right, we got no cars behind us. I'm just going to flick through ride modes. I'm going to put it in rider mode, which I configured. So we have uh, track. ABS, I believe, which may or may not come in handy. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember what my other settings were. Uh, I think road, throttle map. This bike doesn't need different throttle modes, I don't think. I mean, road mode is sublime. The fueling is excellent and there's plenty of power. You don't really need the response to be any different, I don't think, but there you have it. You do have some ride modes you can choose from. <laughs> little power willy little power woolly I probably would get better gas mileage if I didn't love the sound of the engine so much <laughs> it does make you want to rev it alright here we are everybody on lover's lane where we talk about passenger accommodations where we are not going to talk about anything when it comes to this bike no passenger foot pegs no passenger seat no passengers allowed which I think is um, I don't know makes sense because you just want to ride this bike by yourself. Really, you want to ride it by yourself with a bunch of friends on the same bike on a racetrack. <laughs> you want a uh, layperson's uh, version of the Moto2 World Championship. But you probably won't get that. Either way, you won't be bringing any passengers. All right, here we go, team. Onto our twisty section of tarmac. Let's cross our fingers for no slow moving SUVs and whatnot since we're on our sport bike and everything. Yeah, carving through corners, yeah. Nice and smooth. Definitely a lot of feedback from the suspension. <laughs> a, a little bit of a bumpy road like this, it's like, it's reminding you every couple feet that there is a bump. But that's, you know, that's what you want. Typical Olin suspension, it is, um, it's firm, but it's not unforgiving. It's fairly compliant. I mean, it's designed to be top line when you're on smooth asphalt, and that it is. The thing about going through corners like this on this bike is it's great. And a little bit of body English helps a little bit. You just sort of like, if you drop one cheek off the side of the seat, then the handling gets really neutral and light. It's not like an ADV bike where you just sit in the middle of the seat and twist the bars and the bike feels fine. Uh, it responds definitely to moving around a little bit. But the thing is about riding through these curves like this is that I want to be going faster and I shouldn't go any faster. Just every time I see a corner coming, I want to just like, I want to bail in there and put my knee on the ground. Uh, it just wa it wants to lean over. It wants to go faster. But yeah, that's the thing, right? I mentioned a, a Yamaha MT-07 earlier because they're about the same weight with a full tank. Um, there are not a lot of other similarities, honestly, but that is one similarity. And I, I, an MT-07 suspension is much worse and the brakes are much worse 
Um, and the handling just isn't quite as precise on an MT-07, for example. But on a road like this, or on your favorite twisty road, wherever it is, hopefully not in the burbs like this one is, you really don't need much more than an MT-07 to go quickly on a street ride, to have fun um, and feel um, the g-forces of going through a corner and enjoy yourself. And I don't want to call it a problem with this bike, but it definitely is goading me into doing things I shouldn't do. <laughs> so it requires some self-restraint, which is uh, another reason that sport bikes are arguably not the best street bikes because what they want to do is not advisable for the street. But that's a whole nother podcast, as they say. So I mentioned the engine earlier and I said that this engine is actually closer to the spec engines that they give to Moto2 World Championship bikes than it is to the Street Triple. That is according to Triumph. There's probably some PR spin in there somewhere, right? But the truth is this engine did get quite a few updates to take it away from the same spec as the Street Triple RS engine. It has uh, different connecting rods, different pistons, different porting, different cam profiles, different intake valves, I believe, which are titanium in this bike. Um, I think it has a modified crank. Uh, I'm, I'm pulling this all out of my brain after uh, writing the article about this bike. Um, but yeah, the differences are, are vast. Um, and it makes for a slightly different power profile. The, the maximum power on this bike comes at 12,000 seven something maybe uh peak power on the street triple rs comes at 11 7 maybe 11 2 i forget exactly but anyway the power comes higher up on this bike than it does on the street triple that's because of the uh, modified engine so they have done a lot to this engine and um the service intervals to triumph's credit are not any different than a street triple you gotta adjust the valves every 20,000 miles i think it was and according to the manual. Point being, the spec is higher, but not so high that the maintenance schedules are ridiculous or anything like that. It's not really that kind of limited edition bike where it's like, ah, you gotta have, um, a, you know, you gotta hire a mechanic to work on the thing all the time. <laughs> and I think that's partly to do with the Moto2 World Championship also because they want those engines to last, right? They, they don't want their engines blown up left and right. Um, so they create a spec of engine that is um, sensical for the application. <laughs> a little stoppy. Outstanding. The brakes are very, very, very good. Um, those are 310 millimeter rotors uh, with the Brembo Stylema calipers. So the Stylema rotors are, I'm oh, sorry, Stylema calipers are from uh, really RSV4, 1100, Panigale V4, that kind of thing. So super top spec calipers and the rotors are a little bit smaller normally like a, a big super bike like a big Aprilia or Ducati or something like that would have 330 mil rotors these are 310 mm, and uh, I have seen some complaints in forums and that kind of thing that ah the rotors should be bigger but uh, I think there's plenty of brake there's I mean there's way plenty enough plenty of brake for uh, the street if you take it to the track uh, and really hammered on it super super hard um, I suppose the smaller rotors would be worse, but then again, you know, less less unsprung weight, less rotating mass, so I don't know, I think it was all for a reason. Oop, oop, honk the horn by accident. Time to go, everybody. And back to talking about the engine. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good. We haven't really talked about the dash, have we? Gosh, I forgot about that. Uh, we can do it real quick here. Oop, uh, there's yellow light. I don't know if we can do it real quick, actually. Might be time to go soon. All right, another red light. Now we can talk about the dash. For real this time. Um, so yeah, uh, all the stuff along the bottom of the dash there, uh, you can cycle through with this joystick. So trip meters, coolant temp, uh, you can put it in different styles. So you can just check out this, we can do a slightly different dash. Or you can do this one. <laughs> It's pretty cool. It's a it's a really nifty dash setup. And then to get to the menus, you hit this home button over here, and it's a it's a nice nice system. Works really well. The joysticks can be a little fiddly, especially to use with gloves. But I think Triumph has um, figured theirs out pretty well. My colleague Spurgeon Dunbar does not agree. He doesn't like the um, Triumph uh, electronics, but I think they're pretty good. So yeah, overall, it's an awfully good motorcycle. 
it sounds great it looks great it works well like i said everything is super precise there's just like it's dripping with class it's very impressive um and it's a great bike works really well <laughs> even does little woolies maybe we'll do a big one later well now if you watch moto 2 world championship sometimes you see them go off in a gravel trap right well you know because i am very comprehensive in my testing i figured we should test the same thing what if you're on a road race track and you go off in the dirt <laughs> well here we go we're going down <laughs> we're in the gravel we just went off the outside of turn two at Wachimahuza Luna in uh, Spain. <laughs> we can test the traction control, I suppose. Yeah, so it's letting me do wheelies, but you can't spin it up in the dirt. It's pretty cool. This little sandy surface is not my friend, though. Who'd have thought that uh, Pirelli Super Corsa SP tires <laughs> would not be great in uh, powdery dirt? Merging, merging. That, woo! That, I got a little spin. Oh man, look at that. Okay, jump. Here we go on the jump. <laughs> oh my god, that's actually remarkable. It didn't even come close to bottoming. Not even close. Landing off that little baby jump. All in suspension. It's not even supposed to be good at that, but that was amazing. Such a plush landing. Whew. Good job, little fella. So here we go. Will it do a wheelie? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Nice big wheelie. But despite being able to wheelie for long distances if you wanted to, my favorite wheelie on this bike is just the super gentle power wheelie away from a stoplight or up and on ramp onto the freeway or out of your you know favorite turn or your favorite road. It just the power comes on in such a smooth and positive way. It's just it allows for these really low, tiny little wheelies, all from power. Um, and there's not a ton of power on tap, of course. It's not like a, you know, it's not like a Tuono or a CBR 1000 or a Panigale or something where it's going to rip your arms off. Um, but yeah, just a really, really nice amount of power. So is it good as a daily rider then? That's the question. <laughs> oh my gosh it's a lovely machine like I said the service schedules aren't too bad for a sport bike it's not wildly uncomfortable you could make an argument that it's not a bad day rider but of course the real the real upshot here is this engraving on the triple clamp this is number 446 of 765 that are being brought to North America. And as of this video being recorded, there are about 100 left for sale. So by the time you're watching this, they might be sold out. There might be a few left. I don't know. The point is, it's kind of a collector's item, right? You can ride it every day and it'll work. It's a, it's a great machine, but it's not really what it's for. It's for having as a cherished item, whether you take it to the track, whether you ride it on the street, whether you put it in your living room, whatever, it's cool. It's very cool, and I'm a road racing fan. Uh, I'm a fan of MotoGP and Moto2, and I'm a washed up road racer. Uh, so it feels special to me. I like it. I, I think that it, it does have a certain charisma and offer a certain riding experience that you can't get from other bikes. Um, but I also just can't say that I would outright recommend it for daily riding. <laughs> from an ergonomic standpoint, from an exclusivity standpoint, and that kind of thing. And that actually relates uh, quite nicely. That's a good segue to answering Instagram questions that I got about this bike, which we are about to do. We just gotta skip down the freeway and we'll talk about this bike's competition um, and how it stacks up to its siblings, other bikes in the motorcycling world. And uh, I don't know, some other stuff that you guys asked. Lots of good questions this time around. I'm excited about it. So bear with me. <laughs> Off ramp test. Cars in the way. Not very exciting. <laughs> Fast sweepers though. That's what this bike's good at. We never did talk about whether or not you can back it in. So here we go. 
Finally, we're on to the test. Yeah, you can get Swayze backing it in. And that's with ABS on. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, I forgot, into the wrong parking lot. We gotta go back to our, our, new, uh, our new parking lot just down the way from the old parking lot. <laughs> but yeah, point being, uh, you can get all Swayze and sideways um, with ABS on. It's in track mode uh, and it allows a whole bunch of slip. It's really fun, it's excellent. Thank you. Triumph for doing that. I'll give it a few revs. Oh my goodness. What an excellent, excellent sound. It's lovely looking too, isn't it? Oh man, it's great. It's like blunt kind of shark nose and all the carbon. No, it's halogen headlights though. <laughs> Which just goes to show they didn't really, um, you know, they didn't phone it in, but they didn't try super hard on this bike. They didn't build it to sell 20,000 of them. They built to sell 1,500 of them or 1,600, whatever it is. 765 in North America and 765 for the rest of the world. Okie dokie, time to jump into some Instagram questions. First one from Valle Dominici. 765 or upcoming Aprilia RS660. Well, upcoming is the key word there, right? How the heck am I supposed to know if you should get this or an RS660 if it's upcoming? Lucky for you, uh, I am friends with Ari Henning who has ridden the RS660 and he has reported back to me what it was like. <laughs> so I haven't ridden an RS660, I'll say that. But um, it is much cheaper than this bike and it is also much slower. I mean, it's less than 100 horsepower, it's designed for the street, it's much more upright riding position, uh, and it's a little parallel twin instead of a, this triple. Point being, it is a different type of bike. It's not a limited edition thing. It's, um, yes, it's European. Yes, it's sporty, but this is, um, at least a half step above, probably a full step <laughs> above an RS660 as far as, uh, aggression and intent. TS Willow asks, are there any unique advantages to the triple over say an inline four or something like a V twin in the Super Duke or Ducati Panigale? I assume you mean Ducati Panigale V2. Um, are there unique advantages to the triple? Uh, well, so here's the thing with the triple, right? It's supposed to be the torque of a twin, but the revs of an inline four. And obviously it's not exactly that, but that is kind of what you get. Uh, you get a cool sound and you get a nice broad mid-range, good torque, um, but you still get the revs of, uh, of, of a sport bike. In a lot of ways, it's the best of both worlds. So that's what you get, TS Willow. And if you haven't ridden a triple, I recommend it. They're almost all quite good from Yamaha to Triumph. So yeah. Rowdy Skins asks, you're a taller fella, Zach, do you fit? Could you make this into a comfortable sport tour or is it really just a track weapon? I wouldn't tour on it, no. <laughs> I would much rather take it to a racetrack than take it on a tour. Of course, you can tour on anything. You can tour on whatever you want, but no, I would not tour on this bike. I would either ride it at a racetrack or on a sunny Sunday afternoon or uh, just park it somewhere and look at it because it's beautiful. Nick Alborn, 72. Nick Alborn? Nick Nickelborn, Nick Alborn, I'm going with that, uh, says Daytona 765, GSX-R 750 from Suzuki, Ducati Panigale V2, or MV Augusta F3 800, and why? Well, that's quite a question. GSX-R 750 is comparable to this in so much as it's similar horsepower and is sort of a similar size, but it's just sort of like the plebeian version of this, right? It doesn't have any of the options and nifty features that this has. It doesn't have all the spicy components, which is what makes this more special than a GSX-R 750 flat out. So if you want something to take the track and maybe tip over, GSX-R 750 would be a good choice. Panigale V2 is actually a really good question. Uh, the Panigale V2 is very similar to this bike. It actually reminds me a lot of the Daytona 765 in so much as it is a world-class sport bike with all of the components and, uh, and sort of electronics and all the features that you expect from a world-class sport bike, except it doesn't have 180, 200, 215 horsepower, which I actually think is great for riding on the track. I loved riding the Pentagon V2 on the track, and I am certain that I would love riding this bike on the track for the same reason. It's not overwhelming in its power. It's just excellent at everything else and fast enough to be fun. So yeah, when it comes down to it, I don't know. Uh, if you're slightly smaller in stature, I think you'd prefer the Triumph uh, 765. And of course, Pentagon V2s are probably going to be a little bit easier to find <laughs> on showroom floors. But yeah, other than that, they're very, they're very comparable. Um, and I bet, uh, I bet lap times would be pretty similar actually, despite the Ducati being up about, what, 15, 20 horsepower. 
as for the MV Gusta F3800, uh, this bike's got it got it whipped, I bet. I haven't ridden an F3800 in a while. Um, it's an excellent engine. It's really fun. Uh, and the chassis is quite good. The brakes are good, but the electronics are a nightmare on MV Gustas and just the riding experience in general doesn't come anywhere. It's not even, it wouldn't even be close to uh, a Triumph, let alone a Triumph like this. So hope that helps. Nickelborn, thank you. Next up, Aero Rider asks, maybe this is a bit obvious, but how does it compare to the old Daytona 675R? Good question. How it compares to the 675R is very similar. Um, the engine's obviously bigger and stronger, but you know, I mean, if you wanted to get one of these to take the track, don't think that you need this. Heck no. You could easily get a, uh, an old 675R and ride that and you'd have a hoot and you wouldn't know the difference, frankly. <laughs> this is just bespoke and rare exclusive. Speaking of exclusive, last question is from Levi Cook one who asks, do the higher end components make it worth the premium over the Street Triple RS, or is it just flash and exclusivity? Good question, Lewis Cook. Um, sorry, Levi Cook, is that what it was? Anyway, yes, is the answer to your question, or no, whatever. Yes, it is, it, it's just exclusivity and flash. That's what it is. Um, most of us, myself included, if we were gonna go to our favorite Sunday riding road or our favorite racetrack, a Street Triple RS is gonna be the bike to be on. You know, I mean, it, that bike is excellent at all that stuff and it's more comfortable and it's cheaper. You really don't gain much with the 765 Daytona, except that you gain looking at it, which I gotta say is really fun. <laughs> It's pretty compared to most motorcycles, especially pretty compared to a street triple, in my opinion. The worst thing about this bike is that it has a sibling that you should probably buy instead. <laughs> so that's like arguably bad for Triumph, but also arguably it's good. And arguably it's good for you because you know you have an, a great option in the street triple RS. And that's probably the bike that I would get if I wanted to flog something, honestly. That's it for Instagram questions. Thanks so much. Stay tuned. We're about to go rate this sucker on the Daily Rider Leader Board. And here we go, back at Daily Rider headquarters. Uh, it's a cloudy day, it's a little dark in here. Sorry about that. I'll get, uh, why is that a little better? Anyway, here we are at the Daily Rider chart and leader board. I don't have a, I didn't have a good pin color for the so It's gonna be purple. Tram's gonna be purple. I, I didn't plan this out, but it's the only color left. I gotta order more pins. So, expensive versus cheap, 17.5. That is a whole heck of a lot of money for a middleweight sport bike, I think we can agree. So it's gonna be, you know, in this general area. As far as cool versus dorky, I just don't know how you would ever be able to defend thinking that this bike is dorky. It's built on the bones of, of an excellent, if not iconic, sport bike in the 675R. And then it's got all this like Moto2 branding, which is kitschy and silly, but hey, it's a collector's item, man. There's only gonna be so many of them in the world. I think it's uh, undeniably cool and undeniably expensive. Um, so it's gonna go right here, at least as cool as uh, Ducati Street Fighter V4, in my opinion. So we got it on the board. Now we gotta jot down the name. Don't worry, everybody, I got a new pen. So the, it should be nice and crispy this time, but let's see. Triumph, Daytona 765. There she be. All right. If the new pen was on the Daily Rider leaderboard, it would be cheap and awesome. Anyway, so is it better than a Cruiser? Absolutely. It is, you know, in some ways, approximately as uncomfortable as a Harley Lowrider S. <laughs> but it's more purposeful and it's lighter to push around in and out of your garage and the electronics are better and uh, there's so many things about it that are just kind of objectively better than that bike. So it's gonna be above here. We got these two vintage bikes holding it down. I don't actually know if a low rider is worse than a vintage two stroke. It's heavier and not faster. And I don't know if it's safer. I can't say, I guess so I'm gonna stick with that for now. But anyway, the Triumph sport bike is gonna be up here somewhere. Better than an Africa Twin? No, better than a Ducati Street Fighter V4S. <sighs> I don't think so. Ducati's got as many electronics and all that jazz and, you know, just as safe and it's more comfortable. Same with an MT-03. MT-03 doesn't have traction control, but like you don't need it because it's got like 14 horsepower. <laughs> but seriously, MT-03 is a great daily rider and uh, I will not have it laughed at even by my own self. So there you have it. We got this Daytona 765 Moto2 is going to slide in right there. Not quite as good as an MT-03. Uh, better than my KTM 950 Supermoto um, because you know the seat's lower and um, the riding position is less comfortable on the Moto 2 on the Daytona 765 than it is on my KTM Supermoto, but um, it offers a lot more 
um, for the daily ride in general, I would say, in terms of safety features. And oh boy, I'm talking about safety features. We gotta go, we gotta end this episode, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for watching, I hope you had fun. I'll see you next time on Daily Rider. Yeah, boy. Just a really bad day for traffic, everybody. Freaking hot mess. Strike somewhere or something? This guy's got a merge now. What the f <laughs> I've just never seen so many trucks in my life. Ugh.